So good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm Catherine Bradley with the uh, DOT's Office of Environmental Management. I appreciate you joining us for this very important training. We're very excited to be uh, presenting to you. We've had a lot of interest, a lot of people register. So I'm happy to have that kind of interest in engineer, engineering analysis and PDE. Uh, we've updated our engineering chapter, uh, and this, is, um, this training is going to pretty much follow that chapter. That's part two, chapter three in the PDE manual. And it's going to teach you the requirements for the engineering analysis and documenting it in the preliminary engineering report. For this training, you'll receive one and a half PDH credits. But to, write, to provide this number of required training minutes, we had to cut our question and answer time. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the questions tab you go to. And we'll answer as many as possible, but we'll also provide answers with the follow-up notifications from the session. So to not waste any more of our precious minutes, let me introduce you to your trainers. They're both uh, professional engineers with a lot of pd &E experience. That's Laura Rose and Kelly Roberts. So with that, you guys can take it away. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and turn off our cameras to try and conserve bandwidth. Like Catherine said, we have quite a few people here today, so welcome. As you can see, um, we are going to be doing a presentation on the 2024 pd and &E Manual Part 2, Chapter 3 training, which is focusing on engineering analysis. Our theme for today is going to be putting together the pieces of the puzzle. So you'll see this theme throughout the presentation. All right. So we're going to go through a few housekeeping items real quick um, with GoToWebinar. Catherine mentioned the question box. This is what it might look like if you are on a desktop. It's a little square thought bubble with a question mark in it. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and type your question in there. Note that the question will only be sent to the meeting moderators, to our staff. Um, it will not go to the entire audience. Our team will be sending out some links to you guys through the chat, which is a separate icon, um, but that is more one-way communication from us to you guys. Um, so if you have any questions for us, you need to use the question box. If you are on a mobile device or on a tablet, uh, the location of that question box might be slightly different. So take a look around your screen to see if you can find it, but it should be the same square um, thought bubble with a question mark in it. If you have any technical issues today, um, we suggest you go to support.goto.com. We do have a large audience today, so some delay um, between the transitions or animations and things like that is expected. Um, but if you have any other technical issues, you can go to support.goto.com um, and hopefully you checked your system requirements before joining. But assuming that we are all here and ready to go, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So first up, we are talking about part two, chapter three of the pd and &E manual. Uh, we wanted to go ahead and share a couple of links through the chat. Uh, the first one that's coming up is the documents and resources page on the OEM website. This is a fantastic resource. If you're new to pd and &E, um, this is a great place to start. Uh, there's a lot of information on OEM's website, but this is one of my favorites. Um, it's got things like templates, forms, um, guidebooks, handbooks, resources, and archives. Great source of information for pd and &E. The next link that we're going to share is the pd and &E manual link, which can also be found on the documents and resources page, but we'll send you the direct link in the chat. And this sends you directly to the current pd and &E manual. On that page, you're going to find the pd and &E manual by chapter and by part. You can also scroll down to the bottom and download the entire document. If you prefer to have it on your desktop, um, you can review previous versions on that page. And also there are little training links next to each chapter um, or most of the chapters. So if you have any information or any questions about the chapter, you can utilize those training links as well. Um, today's session is being recorded and will be posted, hopefully alongside that part two, chapter three training link. So 
If you're new to PD&E, um, since we do have quite a large audience today, hopefully today's presentation will give you a good introduction to engineering and PD&E for FDOT projects. All right, moving into the chapter. The first thing I wanna draw your attention to is on the right side of the screen is our little sidebar here. This is formatted to follow the table of contents of part two, chapter three. Uh, we sent you the links already to the pd &E manual. If you wanna go ahead and open part two, chapter three to have it um, as we go through, it's a 60 page document. So we've got a lot to cover today. But this sidebar will kind of show you where we are, what we're talking about as we move through the chapter. So keep an eye on that. Again, we're putting together the pieces of the puzzle and moving right along. So part two, chapter three of the pd &E manual defines FDOT's procedure for engineering analyses to support development of general project location and design concepts during the project development and environment studies. The engineering analysis builds upon the information developed and documented by DOT during the planning phase of the project, if there was one. It also defines the project features essential to the assessment of project impacts on the social, cultural, natural, and physical environment. You're gonna hear that phrase a couple times today. It also seeks to balance project needs while ensuring project costs and environmental impacts are minimized. So this is where we are applying engineering to minimize impacts, which is kind of cool. And then what we commonly think of with engineering is your design considerations. Um, so this is also the phase where we establish the necessary design considerations to support the progression of the project from concept to preliminary design and eventually to final design. All right, we would not be pd &E if we didn't have a bunch of acronyms. <laughs> so in section 312 of the chapter, you're gonna find our definitions and acronyms. Some of the ones that you're gonna hear today pretty frequently are pd &E study, which is Project Development and Environment Study, COA, which is Class of Action, Preliminary Engineering Report, or your PER. So as I mentioned, the definitions and common terms can be found in this section 312 of the chapter, but there is also an entire acronyms list on the pd &E manual webpage. If you look on that page that we sent you the link to, on the bottom of part one, there is an acronyms list, which is 11 pages long. We are going to try and sprinkle in a little bit of humor for you today. <laughs> These are just some of the acronyms that you will see on that acronyms list. And with that, I will turn it over to Tally to talk about the next section. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Hi, everyone. I am going to first speak about section 3.2.1, which is our level of detail of analysis. So the level of detail for engineering analysis depends on overall size and complexity of the project, as well as your class of action or type of environmental document. So we have lots of those acronyms on this slide for you, so bear with me. Non-major state action, NMSA, and a type one categorical exclusion, CE projects, require a lesser level of analysis and do not require a pd and &E study. On the other hand, a type two categorical exclusion, environmental assessment, environmental impact statement, and state environmental impact report. Those projects require a more detailed level of analysis with engineering documentation. The level of detail is also based on the future plans for the project, whether the project is anticipated to go design bid build or design build, whether it's being fast-tracked versus being put on a shelf. It should be noted that the timing of the class of action decision is being delayed until closer to the public hearing. But regardless of your class of action, the engineering analysis must be performed to a level of detail that is sufficient to assess the effects of the alternatives on the social, economic, natural, cultural, and physical environment. 
Moving on along to our project coordination, section 3.2.2. A successful pd &E study requires orderly and continuous coordination between planning, engineering, environmental, public involvement, and other staff from various offices. The pd &E project manager is responsible for coordination with various FDOT offices, such as these listed at the top of your screen, and external agencies, such as these at the bottom of your screen, and the public throughout the life of the study. So now it's time for our first audience engagement. Um, sticking with our puzzle or game theme, we have a Jeopardy question for you, or should I say answer? So project coordination for a million dollars. The project manager is responsible for coordinating with these 16 departments or disciplines. Name as many as you can. So I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee, who is going to bring up a form to enter in your answers. A link to the form is also provided in the chat. So please put commas between each one of your answers so they come in separately. And if for some reason the form doesn't work for you, just type your answers into the question box. Okay, I see Kaylee has it up. And we'll give you guys um, a couple minutes to type in your answers. You can scan the QR code or follow the link that we have in the comments. I see some letters. There we go. There's some There's departments and disciplines. Nice. Very good. Wow, you guys are covering almost all of them, I feel like. I'll reveal the answers. I'll give you guys a couple more minutes seconds. <laughs> I like that environmental is still the, the most common one. It is. Yeah. Yeah. The bigger <laughs> ones are the more popular answers. So and drainage as well, always, always including drainage. Yeah. Traffic. I'm also, th I'm also thrilled that this is working. <laughs> so. <laughs> Looks like we have 84 responses submitted with 306 attendees. So um, I'll give it a couple more minutes if, um, if you haven't responded and want to put, put in some of the departments that maybe you don't see um, already on the screen. Okay. For time's sake, I'm going to take it back and we'll reveal the answers. Okay, so these are the 16 project coordination responsibilities. The project coordination section in the manual is often overlooked. I'm guilty of it. I usually skip all the way back to that PER section. Um, but it, it is an inver a very important um, part to a successful project. This section of the manual was expanded on in our 2024 update to state that all relevant project coordination should be summarized in the public involvement summary documentation, which is your comments and coordination report and the agency coordination and public involvement section of your PER. Also, multimodal coordination was added to this list with the 2024 update. So as the PM, I would treat this section of the manual as the first of many checklists, working my way down the list, making sure that coordination is happening with all 16 of these departments as they are applicable to my project throughout the duration of my project. Okay, and I think I'm handing this back to Lauren to go over preliminary engineering analysis. All right, thank you, Tally. 
All right, so as you guys can see and follow along on the right side, on the sidebar here, we're moving into section 323, where we're talking about preliminary engineering analysis. There's a couple of key elements in performing the engineering analysis during pd &E, and they are, let's try that, there we go. The project purpose and need, um, data collection, existing conditions analysis, future conditions, design controls and criteria, and then moving into your alternatives analysis in section 324. So we're going to go through and step through each of these in the following slides, um, and you can see that on the side as we move along. So first up is the purpose and need. As you can see here, um, the purpose and need statement is generally developed during the planning phase. This statement drives the development of the alternatives considered and evaluated. Next up, the PM must review the programming screen summary report for projects that were screened through the ETDM process. That is a really great source of information for the project manager to review any of the information that's previously been gathered on the project. Um, if your project needs to make some changes to the purpose and needs statement, or if one was not developed, um, if your project didn't go through a planning phase, um, highly suggest you take a look at part two, chapter one of the pd &E manual for more information about the purpose and needs statement. Next up is data collection. So data collection should begin by focusing on obtaining the data to assess and support the purpose and need for the project. You wanna think of the purpose and need as the grading criteria for your project. Um, we suggest that you utilize free and easily available data for um, your data collection and data gathering. Check to make sure that the data that you're pulling is current and relevant. So if something has changed in your project area um, and the data that you've got is no longer relevant, um, or if it's super old, might not be the best to use. You can also request data from the appropriate sources to fill gaps where needed. There are many, many free data sources available um, across the state, depending on where you are, um, including both 2D and 3D data to include project elevations, GIS data layers, aerial photography, utility information, et cetera. If you are interested in exploring a little bit more about 2D and 3D data, um, OEM does have a 2D and 3D and pd &E guidebooks on the documents and resources page. So some of the areas that you might be gathering data would be in roadway, um, this could be things like your straight line diagram, as-built plans, traffic, um, like your traffic data for your project or the local um, traffic model, safety data, crash history, and environmental data. So a lot of GIS data layers are available for those features as well. So next up, I'll hand it back over to Tally for existing and future conditions. Okay, moving on along to our existing conditions analysis, which is section 3.2.3.3 in your manual. We're gonna start with previous planning studies, which is now its own subsection in the 2024 update to this chapter. Previously, the previous planning studies information was kind of sprinkled throughout the chapter, but now we have it lumped under in its own subsection of the existing conditions analysis. So previous planning studies, including alternative corridor evaluation reports or ACERs, master plans, et cetera, that were completed to support the development of the study should be reviewed and documented in your PER. If planning decisions or products that were incorporated into NEPA or National Environmental Policy Act by reference, then these five bullets should be discussed as well in your PER. And if there were no previous planning studies for your project, just include a statement to that fact in the PER under this subsection. Moving on to our existing roadway conditions. These are the existing roadway condition elements that should be documented in the PER. There are 25 total. 
So think of this as your checklist for the existing roadway conditions section of your PER, with these 25 items being the subsections. Note that item number 25 is a recent addition to this section in the chapter for the 2024 update. ITS TSMNO was previously its own separate section, but is now lumped under the existing roadway conditions with the other 24 elements. Additionally, the 2024 update to this chapter, um, we expanded on the horizontal alignment and vertical alignment components, so items eight and nine. For the horizontal, uh, we expanded on them in the way that they are, how they are to be described in the existing roadway conditions section, kind of giving um, specific instructions. For the horizontal alignment, we are looking for the deflections, horizontal curves with the length radius and associated super elevation and horizontal clearances they all should be described and your vertical alignment we are looking for grades vertical curve components with length and k value and vertical clearances of course noting the source of best available information for most projects the source of that information could be the combination of data from as-built plans and the straight line diagram Whatever the source of the information, the horizontal and vertical geometry needs to be described with these values if they're available. This section of the chapter was also updated in the 2024 edition to state that if review of the existing conditions identifies a deficiency or substandard element, we need to describe those findings in the existing conditions section and appropriate subsection of your PER. Moreover, if the deficiencies or substandard elements remain in your preferred alternative, so kind of looking forward to your preferred, we will need to see discussion of the de appropriate design variations and design exceptions needed in your preferred alternative section of your PER. More on that to come. Okay, now moving on to our existing bridges and structures section. Um, if there is a bridge or structure within the project limits, it also must be documented. These are the existing bridge condition elements that should be described in the PER if they exist. Another checklist for you. A new addition to this chapter is item 18, fatigue life. A fatigue evaluation is required for existing steel bridges to provide guidance during the decision-making process regarding whether the steel bridge or portions thereof should remain or be replaced. So if your project includes a steel bridge, fatigue life needs to be discussed in the existing bridge and structure conditions section of your PER. So we've talked about all of the engineering existing conditions. Now we're moving to our existing environmental features. The existing conditions analysis must include a review of potential environmental issues in your project area that would affect the development of project alternatives. Of course, like we spoke about earlier, close coordination between environmental and engineering staff is essential in developing alternatives that reduce environmental impacts. Okay, so we talked about existing. We're going to co go back to the future or forward to the future. In your future conditions section, we're looking for items such as travel demand, any changes in land use, changes in context classification, and other improvement plans. These all should be documented in your PER in the future conditions section if they exist. So your travel demand is your design traffic from your traffic report, which is your PTAR typically. Any changes in land use or context classification can be found in local planning documents, LRTP, development plans, etc., or local permitting documents, or documentation for nearby projects. This section was expanded on in the 2024 update to the chapter to state that if there are ongoing or committed projects near the project area, that may impact the transportation network, we need to include a discussion of those projects here in the future conditions section of your PER. This could include a local, state, or federal roadway project in the area. 
And as I mentioned a few slides earlier, any coordination regarding other projects should be documented in the Comments and Coordination Report and the Public Involvement and Agency Coordination section of your PER. So thanks for uh, going back to the future with me, a little, another little fun, humorous graphic there for you guys. Because we're about to get down to the nitty gritty. OK, so we have our design controls and criteria section next, which is section 3235. The design controls guide the selection of your appropriate design criteria that is going to be used in developing your project alternatives. The chapter includes these 13 design controls that are to be documented in your PER if they apply. The first six items are the typical design controls that we think of, and they tie directly back to FDM Chapter 201, which is your design controls chapter. Design control items 7 through 13 may not apply to all projects, but these are elements that could control the selection of the design criteria moving forward. If any of these design control controls is not applicable to your project, just include a statement to that fact in your PER. So I'm going to go through some of those design controls that may not apply to all projects, but could determine the design criteria to be used in the alternatives development. So for your physical constraints, we're talking about a pinch point in your right of way, maybe a railroad or a major utility on one side of the road. Environmental constraints are what you think of what, um, what was discovered on your desktop review, public parks, historic and cultural features, wetlands, flood floodplains. For a type of stormwater management facilities, really just talking about whether um, a closed or open drainage system is required. And for navigational requirements, design high water, um, which would include impacts from, from projections. These would only apply to bridges over water, obviously. Um, and then design wave heights would only apply for coastal bridges. And that would include impacts from sea level rise projections. OK, so we're moving on to our design criteria. So we need to be including a table in your PER of all of the relevant roadway, structure, and drainage design criteria to be used in developing project alternatives. Include references to the associated manuals, like seen here on the right side of the table, procedures, and guidelines that defined the criteria. For projects on the state highway system or national highway system, the principal source is going to be your FDM, like, like we show here. For federally funded projects on local roadways, the Florida Green Book would be the source of the design criteria. And again, comparison of the existing conditions against these current design controls and criteria, if that identifies a roadway or structure element that does not meet current standards, those deficiencies must be discussed analyzed and documented in your PER, or if it's a bridge replacement, it would be in the BDR, Bridge Development Report. So it's important to remember also that all parts of what end up being the preferred alternative design need to have its associated design criteria documented in this section. This includes not only the roadway design criteria, but also the drainage design criteria and structure, de structure design criteria if your project includes a bridge. Additionally, if you have a project, for, for example, along a limited access roadway that crosses a minor roadway or arterial, and improvements along that minor roadway or arterial are included in the build alternative and ultimately your preferred alternative, there should be design criteria set forth for both that limited access roadway and the minor roadway or arterial. A similar situation would be if you have uh, another interstate project with mainline design criteria, but then you're also proposing improvements along the ramps. Those ramps have different design speeds, different design criteria. So you would have to have a table listing your mainline design criteria as well as your ramp design criteria in your PER. So ultimately, what ends up being proposed in your preferred alternative needs to have its criteria defined in this section of the PER. OK, I'm going to hand it back over to, to talk about alternatives analysis. All right. So moving into section 324, you can see on the right side here, um, following along with the chapter, we're going to talk about the alternatives analysis 
And this is a process of developing, evaluating, and eliminating potential project alternatives based on the purpose and need for the project. Remember we said earlier, your purpose and need is really your grading criteria um, on whether or not an alternative should move forward. Alternatives analysis involves evaluation of both engineering and environmental aspects of the project. So when Tali was going through those existing conditions, um, we're talking about both engineering and environmental, and we're utilizing our engineering design criteria and our engineering analysis to try and find the least impactful alternatives. So the different, there are a couple different types of alternatives, and the alternatives analysis of an FDOT PD&E study must consider four alternatives. They are the no action alternative, which you'll commonly hear me call a no build, a TSMNO alternative, transportation systems management and operations, we love our acronyms, build alternatives, and a multimodal alternative. So these four must be considered as part of your PD&E study. So we're gonna move through each of those real quick. Um, the first up is the no action alternative or the no build alternative. And that is defined as the alternative in which the proposed project activity would not take place. This does not mean that you freeze the situation. It just means that we're not proposing any um, improvements as part of the project under the no action alternative but if there are other committed projects in the area those still move forward you know growth still happens things like that so that's included in your analysis the no action alternative or the no build serves as your baseline or benchmark against which the build alternatives are evaluated the engineering analysis must analyze the effects of the no action alternative to the same level of detail as the build alternatives so like i said we're looking at the growth over time for both the um, no build and the build alternatives the no action alternative is the only alternative that does not meet the purpose and need, but can still be carried forward and should still be carried forward in the alternatives analysis. The no action alternative remains under consideration throughout the pd &E study, um, including the public hearing. Both the PER and environmental document must include and discuss the no action alternative. If applicable, the no action alternative should include a discussion of projects already programmed in the area, like I mentioned earlier, and if they change the anticipated impacts or the purpose and need of the project. Documentation of the alternatives analysis must include the advantages and disadvantages of the no action alternative. So some advantages might be no right of way impacts, no environmental impacts, um, no construction delays, those types of things. Um, disadvantages could be um, if the <laughs> traffic continues to decline or if um, yeah. sorry about that so we'll move on into the TSMNO alternative which is the transportation systems management and operations alternative the TSMNO alternative includes strategies with the operational objective of preserving the capacity and improving the security, safety, and reliability of the transportation system while minimizing environmental impacts. One thing that a lot of folks um, tend to skim over, it's constant, or happens occasionally where folks skim over the TSMNO alternative, but it's important to realize that you need to evaluate the TSMNO alternative before evaluating build alternatives. So prior to evaluating the build alternatives, engineering analysis must demonstrate that maximization of the existing system through various TSMNO strategies will not meet the purpose and need for the project. If the TSMNO alternative does not meet the purpose and need for the project, the PER and environmental document must briefly explain why. So you need to evaluate this alternative before moving into your build alternatives. Next up is multimodal alternatives. When consistent with the purpose and need, the alternatives analysis should consider multimodal alternatives. Multimodal alternatives can include non-motorized facilities for pedestrians and bicyclists to meet the purpose and need for the project. 
The discussion of multimodal alternatives should include needs that are stated in the Long Range Transportation Plan, the Transit Development Plan, and the Local Government Comprehensive Plan. Next up is the build alternatives. There's a few key points before um, you develop your build alternatives that you need to keep in mind. To ensure the meaningful evaluation of build alternatives, each build alternative must have logical termini and should be of sufficient length to address the environmental matters and the purpose and need on a broad scope. So this means that your start and end points for the project need to make sense or for the alternative. Independent utility. Um, so the project needs to function as designed and be a reasonable expenditure, even if no additional transportation improvements in the area are made. So that means that if this project is constructed as proposed for the preferred, it still works and makes sense in the final um, product. Continuing to talk about the build alternatives. The PM and the project team may consider opportunities for developing hybrid alternatives that could incorporate TSMNO strategies and or multimodal options with the build alternative to meet the purpose and need for the project. So that's really cool because if you've already done your multimodal alternative analysis and your TSMNO analysis, if those alternatives don't meet the purpose and need for the project, you can still incorporate some of those strategies and features into the build alternative to make them more efficient and fit your project. So that analysis is not wasted, even if they are not carried forward as a viable alternative. Each alternative must be explored at a sufficient level of detail to support a reasoned choice. All alternatives under consideration must be developed to a comparable level of detail so that their comparative merits may be evaluated. This means that you can't um, pick a favorite early on and just analyze that one to a higher level of detail. If it's a reasonable and feasible alternative um, and it's carried through the project and not eliminated, they need to be evaluated to the same level of detail or a comparable level of detail. All right, so we just went through the four alternatives that must be considered in the alternatives analysis. We're going to pop up a quiz for you here for an audience engagement with a couple of answers. If you were paying attention um, or if you have the chapter up, this one should be pretty straightforward, but there's also a few answers on here that might be a little bit tricky. So go ahead and input your answers for us. All right, got quite a few responses coming in. All right, I think we're starting to slow down. We see a pretty good split here. Siobhan, I don't know if you want to close it out and share the answers with everybody. Um, the correct answer is B, the no action, TSMNO, multimodal, and build alternatives. We did have a couple on C and D. We tried to sprinkle in a few trick answers there for you guys. But the four that must be evaluated are the no action, TSMNO, multimodal, and build. So we are running um, perfectly on time here. So we've got a few extra minutes. We're going to give you a quick five minute break and we will return for the rest of the presentation to go over the development of the build alternatives in about five minutes. So if you guys need to take a quick stretch break, now would be a great time to do that.
For those of you that are hanging out with us during this break, if you would like to utilize the question box to type in any questions that you have so far, I know we've thrown a lot of lists at you and a lot of information. We're about halfway through the presentation. So if anything comes to mind that you would like further clarification on, we've got some folks trying to address those questions in the chat box, or I'm sorry, in the question pane. Um, and then we'll also have a short Q&A at the end. Tally, I'm going to stop this timer early because I have no idea how loud it's going to be. But oh, yeah, we don't want an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> got about 30 seconds left if you want to um, go ahead okay, and take yeah. the screen and you can take the sure next section. Will. Sounds good. Okay, I think we're ready to get started again. Now moving on to the development of build alternatives. So the number of build alternatives to be analyzed in detail during the PD&E study must be relative to the size and complexity of the project. So think back to that level of detail of analysis um, slide and how that corresponds to our class of action. So an EA or a type two categorical ex exclusion or SEER project must evaluate at least one build alternative and a no build alternative. Additionally, the build alternatives must be developed using the design controls and associated design criteria set forth for the facility. As such, only viable or reasonable build alternatives should be evaluated in detail. So you're only doing the deep dive on the viable or reasonable build alternatives. Continuing on for the development of build alternatives, F FHWA, another acronym, getting me tongue tied, <laughs> notes the purpose of the EA is to determine if an EIS is required. So the EA does not need to evaluate in detail all reasonable alternatives, whereas an EIS must evaluate all reasonable alternatives in detail in addition to the no action alternative. So projects an evaluation of alternatives may start by a high-level screening of a broad number of improvements concepts or TSM and O strategies to eliminate unreasonable or non-viable alternatives from further detailed analysis the high-level screening process can be used to quickly identify and evaluate the performance of various improvements and design concepts Typically, EISs and complex EAs are developed through a planning process, which we all know of, um, PEL, planning and environmental linkages for scope and number of alternatives to be considered in your PD&E study. So you would continue on with that, um, with those that are identified in the PEL. Okay, moving on to the alternatives considered but eliminated. As Lauren mentioned earlier, the primary reason for eliminating an alternative from consideration is that it does not meet your project's purpose and need. The screening of alternatives determines if an individual alternative or concept has one or more deficiencies that prevent it from being successfully implemented. And again, we'll mention this again, although the no action alternative does not typically meet the purpose and need, it must be considered as a viable alternative throughout the study. Okay, a little brain break, another audience engagement for you guys. We have Alex back with us. <laughs> um, we have build alternatives for a million dollars. There are 23 engineering elements that must be considered within the build alternatives name as many as you can. So I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee again, who's going to bring up the form where you can enter in your answers. The link to the form is also provided in the chat. And again, please put commas between each one of your answers so they come in separately. And if it doesn't work, then you can just type your answers into the question box. Okay, Kaylee, take it away.
I don't see the form. Is she able to bring it up? There we go. While everybody's typing in their answers, I want to give a huge shout out to the folks who are helping us behind the scenes with dealing oh. with GoTo and PowerPoint and all of these um, audience engagement points. So huge thank you guys to Jennifer, Siobhan, and Kaylee. Yes, thank Appreciate you. Thank it. you. All right, so I see a lot of engineering elements. Yes, we're getting a good number of them. Drainage, again, is a big one. It's important. We'll give it a few more minutes. It looks like 43 responses have been submitted, 50. Okay, it is always awkward to sit here in silence. <laughs> I see that 91, almost 100 responses have been submitted. So I'm going to take the screen back and show you guys the answers. Okay. So each of these 23 engineering elements should be discussed in the PER if they apply to your project. If an element does not apply, just include a statement to that fact in the PER, but include, um, sorry, not include, but treat this as another checklist. Um, we like checklists here, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, I'm going to quickly note a few elements that were expanded on um, with the 2024 update to the chapter. So element number 20, structures and bridges, was expanded on to include details regarding the cost of perimeter walls and a reference to the highway traffic noise chapter. Additionally, elements 21 and 22, transportation management plan and constructability, are required to be discussed in the PER. Moving on to section 3.2.6, we have our environmental considerations for build alternatives. The development of build alternatives should begin with overlaying the environmental data that you collected during your field review onto a base map, like this example. And the development of build alternatives must consider the environment uh, within which the project will be built and reflect the environmental constraints identified in the project area. So it's not just your engineering criteria and your geometry, it's also the environment and your surroundings. Moving right along to our value engineering section. Again, I think this is another section that is often overlooked. I'm guilty. Um, but all projects on the national highway system utilizing federal aid highway funding, so federally funded projects, with an estimated cost of $50 million or more for non-bridge projects or $40 million or more for bridge projects, this includes all phases of your project, shall have a minimum of one value engineering study. The cost thresholds was, um, the, was another update in our 2024 version of the chapter. Previously, the threshold was 25 million, I believe. Um, but as we all know, things are more expensive these days, so the thresholds um, were raised. So a VE study can be conducted either there, during your PD&E phase or during the initial engineering design, but it has to happen prior to completion of your final design if you meet this threshold. And projects that have a potential for value improvements that don't meet the threshold may also be studied with a VE study. Projects delivered with the design build method, however, um, are not required by federal, federal regulation to have a VE analysis, so you get a little out if you're going design build. 
If the VE study is conducted during the PD&E phase, it must occur after your alternatives analysis is complete, but before the public hearing. Okay, now I'm going to hand it back over to Lauren to discuss our comparative alternatives evaluation. All right, thank you. So moving into section 328, which is your comparative alternatives evaluation. Um, the alternatives analysis requires a comparative evaluation to objectively assess the project alternatives, including the no action, remember that one, continues through at the same level, level of detail in a matrix format. The objective of an alternatives evaluation matrix is to compare the performance of each viable alternative in meeting the um, evaluation criteria and to quantify the impacts to the natural, social, cultural, and physical environment. So one thing to keep in mind um, is that each project is unique and it has its own unique set of challenges. The project manager must carefully provide a balance between the environmental impacts with the engineering considerations and the project costs and along with public input when selecting a preferred alternative. So this might look a little bit like a seesaw with trying to balance all of those. So we're gonna move into an example of an alternatives evaluation matrix. There is a list of suggested items to include in the matrix in the chapter, um, but the evaluation criteria should be developed based on specific project needs and potential impacts. Uh, the list in the chapter is not comprehensive and should be tailored to each project. Um, also, if you have a different type of a project, like a freight or multimodal, or your matrix is gonna look significantly different from this, but there's a great place to start in the chapter in section 328. I'll bring that up. We're going to start with our evaluation criteria on the left and all our alternative names on the right. We always carry through the no build or no action. And for this example, we're going to use alternatives A, B, and C. You can name these whatever works for your project. Could be left, right, center, north, south, 1C, 2A, 4D, whatever um, your alternatives are named and how they were um, processed through your project. But these are just examples. So first up is project cost. Um, your units are obviously going to be in dollars, but some of the project costs that should be included are your design phase, right-of-way acquisition, construction costs, CE&I, uh, wetland habitat and species costs, cultural resources, utility relocations, and operation and maintenance costs. Next up is the purpose and need and the ability to meet the purpose and need. Um, pretty much the only one that should have a no here, or potentially a no, is the no build. Next up is social and economic environment. Some of the things that you could consider in this section would be number of parcels, number of relocations, number of worship centers, um, cemeteries, schools, hospitals, medical centers, farmland, um, and your units are probably going to be in number of um, parcels impacted. Cultural environment could be items like Section 4F resources, the number of historic sites or archaeological sites, parks, rec areas, refuges, and protected lands. For your natural environment, some of your items that you would consider in the matrix would be wetlands and other surface waters, protected species and habitat, floodplains and water resources. Your units for that would likely be in acres and could vary based on your alternative considered. The physical environment category, you would look at things like contamination hazardous waste sites, noise receptors, navigation, air quality, utilities, bicycles, and pedestrians. And then traffic operations and safety. You would look at things like the level of service, which is your LOS, another acronym, throughput, delay, travel time, safety, vehicle miles traveled, and travel time reliability. So as you can see, many of these items will need to be summarized from the supporting technical documents of the PD&E. This chapter is dedicated mostly to the engineering analysis, but it factors in all of these other areas, your social, cultural, natural, physical environment. Um, all of those features are brought together in the evaluation matrix for comparative analysis of your alternatives. 
the engineering of the different alternatives should attempt to minimize those impacts where possible. Another thing to note is that the alternatives evaluation matrix is often utilized for public involvement outreach, including public meetings, handouts. You'll often see this on a board um, at the public meetings um, and your project newsletter when you show up. So it's a great tool for public outreach and showing the compare, comparing the alternatives for your project. Speaking of public involvement, wanted to do a quick shout out to part one, chapter 11 of the pd &E manual. Public involvement is a significant component of the alternatives evaluation and of the pd &E study. So take a look at part one, chapter 11 of the pd &E manual for more information. Um, the requirements for public meetings and public hearings are in that chapter. Um, and there's also a bunch of other resources to explore, including the OEM public involvement webpage, the Office of Policy Planning Community Engagement page, and the FDOT Public Involvement Handbook. So a lot of information here um, that is available to help with your pd &E study and FDOT projects. With that, we're going to hand it over to Tally. Other audience engagement. Here we go. All right. Instead of who wants to be a millionaire, who wants to be an engineer? Thank you. We got, already got the poll up. Is the preferred alternative required to be decided before the public hearing? Yes? No? Well, what's a public hearing? Or well, how about an alternative question? <laughs> so I see the answers coming in. This is kind of a tricky question. We were like 50-50. I see them really almost evening out with one another. No one's um, choosing our, our funny ones. I see one person did. How about an alternative question? Give it a few more seconds. More than half of you have voted. And again, it's about 50-50, yes or no? Okay, we have about 62%. We closed the poll. All right, we closed it. Okay, let me make sure. Oh, I'm sharing the next slide to give you guys the answer. A little bit of a tricky question for you guys. The answer is no. I'll go through that as I... Um, continue on with our preferred alternative section, which is section 329 in the manual. So the environmental document should briefly discuss the proposed design features of your preferred alternative. But on the other hand, your PER should discuss in detail the preliminary design features of the preferred alternative. So your environmental document is going to deep dive into your environmental and summarize your uh, design features whereas your PER is going to deep dive into those design features of your preferred alternative and summarize the environmental impacts. So they work hand in hand. When the design features of the preferred alternative do not meet the designated design criteria, remember to a few sections back where we laid out our design controls and criteria for developing or build alternatives. When that criteria is not met, design exceptions and or design variations must be prepared and approved according to FDM Chapter 122. All right, so thinking back to our tricky poll question, it is normally expected, obviously, that a preferred alternative is chosen prior to your public hearing. But if, in unusual circumstances, a preferred alternative cannot be selected before the public hearing, the district should coordinate with OEM. And for these situations, additional public involvement after the hearing would be expected. And that could range anything from another public hearing to another meeting or a flyer or mailer. Okay, so moving on to our engineering details of the preferred alternative. Guess what? Another list. Here we are. These are the 22 engineering elements of the preferred alternative that should be discussed in the PER. Think of this as another checklist for the preferred alternative section of your PER with these 22 elements being the subsections. If an element doesn't apply to your project, just let us know. Include a statement to the fact that fact in your PER. 
So I'd like to highlight um, item 22, project cost. It's just a small change in our 2024 manual update. This was recently titled cost estimates, which if you're like me, your mind goes straight to construction cost estimate, LRE. Um, but really we're asking for not only just your construction cost um, that is included in this preferred alternative section, subsection, but we're also um, looking for the cost for design, CEI, right of way, utilities and wetland, wetland mitigation, et cetera, as they apply to your project. Next, we have the summary of environmental impacts for the preferred alternative, section 3292. This is a new addition to the 2024 version of the chapter. Environmental elements, including future land use, section 4F, cultural resources, wetlands, protected species and habitat, essential fish habitat, highway traffic noise, and contamination are to be summarized in your PER. Only summaries are needed in your PER and references to other supporting documents, all your other supporting environmental documents are encouraged. Okay, now I'm going to hand it back to Lauren to wrap it up. All right, so the last section of the chapter that we're going to talk about today is documentation. Um, and the first part up in that section is actually the environmental document. So if you go to the chapter and look at this section, the first thing that we are going to talk about is the fact that the environmental document must discuss impacts on the environment from the preferred alternative and other alternatives in comparative form. So this is where your engineering and environmental documents um, need to be consistent. The comparative alternatives evaluation must provide a clear basis for the decision to select the preferred alternative. So we've gone through our alternatives analysis. One of them um, has been selected as a preferred alternative and we need to document the why. The location of the alternatives documentation differs depending on the type of the environmental document. Go ahead and take a look at this section for more guidance um, based on whichever environmental document you are using. Um, you can also see part one, chapter five for more guidance on type two CEs, part one, chapters six and seven for more guidance on EAs and FONSIs, and part one, chapters eight and nine for more guidance on EISs. So next up is the one that most of us scroll to immediately in this chapter is the preliminary engineering report section. The PER is the documentation of the engineering analysis of the PD&E study. I like to think of this document as telling the story of the project and how the alternatives were developed and why. So we're talking about why we're trying to avoid impacts, which impacts we're trying to avoid, and the engineering constraints and considerations that we have to utilize to develop those alternatives. Um, as Tali mentioned, for bridge projects, a PER can be substituted with a bridge development report, a BDR, or a bridge replacement report. Don't see that too often. Um, the PER is a pretty comprehensive document, but it can be done. A list of the items to include in the PER are covered in the chapter as well as references to appropriate chapter sections for more information. So when you're developing your PER, um, this is really where you need to go to double check that you've accounted for everything that was um, incorporated into the chapter. It'll point you in the right direction. So I've seen a couple of questions come through the question box. Um, now we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the tools that are available to assist with the documentation. The first step is the PER QC checklist, um, and this is actually now being required. PERs are required to go through a quality assurance quality control check at the district level before submittal to OEM for review. During this process, the preliminary engineering report QA QC checklist is completed and then submitted to OEM with the PER for review. The OEM review team will have 30 days to review the PER. Um, while this is an official part of the document submittal, it's also a great tool for internal QCs um, and even for document development before the PER goes to the district for review. This document is available on the documents and resources page, which we sent the link out in the chat earlier in the presentation. Um, 
great resource for you to use during your PER development. As a side note, um, if you guys need it when you're kicking off your PD&E study, there's also a QC plan template available on the OEM website if you need that as well. Another tool, this one is a fantastic resource when you're writing your PER, is a PER template. On the Documents and Resources page, you will see it listed as the FDOT Preliminary Engineering Out Report Outline and Guidance. It provides guidance for the preparation of the PER. Um, this is a Word document that you can download. It's already been formatted with the correct um, title page, table of contents, and when you move into the document itself, each section has a little blurb about what is expected in those sections. Um, it is not a regurgitation of the chapter, so your chapter is still your main resource, um, but it definitely points you in the right direction and is a huge help in making sure that your PER contains all of the required sections and um, information that we expect to see when those are submitted. There are some minor tweaks to this template and the QC checklist for the 2024 version of the chapter. Those items are going to be published very soon. Um, we wanted to make sure that they are consistent with the new chapter manual, chapter in the manual, so those will be coming out very shortly. One other thing that we wanted to point out in here, I know we've mentioned it a couple times throughout the presentation, about all of the supporting documents that go into a PD&E study. The PER includes a section in the beginning called a list of technical documents included in the PED&E study. And the PER, when you're writing the body of the document, it often summarizes those supporting documents um, and references them. So all of that information is identified in the PER and generally uploaded to SWEPT. So this is a great template, great tool when you're developing your PD&E study and your PER report. Go ahead and download those from the Documents and Resources page. When we're talking about documentation, um, we would be remiss if we didn't bring up commitments. Actually, Part 2, Chapter 22 of the pd &E Manual. Um, because commitments made during the pd &E phase are implemented during future project phases, it is very important to ensure that the appropriate documentation and tracking of the commitments is carried through all phases of project delivery. Commitments are an important component of the transportation project as they provide assurance to the resource agencies and other stakeholders that the identified concerns will be addressed in future phases of the project delivery. The commitments section should include a list of commitments made, the agreed upon language, and the stakeholders involved. All commitments established as a result of the pd &E study and or agency coordination must be documented in the commitment section of your environmental document. And then it should also be consistent, meaning word for word, in the project summary section of the PER. So those need to be consistent. Um, this is something that is tracked throughout the life of the project through the commitment tracking. And it's the commitments must be reviewed and their status documented in subsequent reevaluations of the project as well. So with that, we have finished up our documentation section. We can hand it back over to Catherine. We've got quite a few minutes left, uh, more than we were expecting for Q&A, but Catherine? Okay, hey, thank you, Lauren. Um, so we have a few questions. I'll try to answer some, and I'm also going to try to keep you here until 3.30 if possible so that we can um, give you your 1.5 PDHs. Um, a couple of questions. Catherine, having a hard time hearing you. Thank you, Lauren. Is that better? A little bit. OK. So a couple of the, the questions that have uh, several times or whether or not this uh, um, PowerPoint will be available at a later time and the answer to that is yes it will be. Um, we'll be sending out a, a follow-up email to everybody that uh, attended and we'll include that there as well as detailed answers to uh, your questions but I'll try to answer some now and Lauren you can jump in as well if, um, if I'm getting it wrong but let me start with the ones I can see and 
and I had to had to make a modification to my computer right now, so I can't see any of the new questions. <laughs> so I might turn it back over to you, Lauren, after this. No but, um, one of the questions was, can we skip developing the TSMNO alternative if we know the project is a shared use path? Or um, and vice versa, the same. Can we skip developing the multimodal alternative if we know, know the project is an interstate limited access only? Uh, well, you don't have to go to great detail to develop that in those cases, but you do have to have it mentioned in the PER report that it, that um, you looked at it, but it did not meet the purpose and need. It doesn't have to be great detail for those type of issues. Um, another Agreed. question. I'm sorry, Lauren, did you have something else on that? No, I was just saying I agree with that. As long as it's um, <laughs> consistent with the purpose and need. If it doesn't meet purpose and need, you just need to document why. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, one was, does the number of alternatives need to be a minimum of three? And if that came while we were talking about the evaluation matrix. I don't know if you mean in the matrix or if you just mean the alternatives looked at. I guess we just kind of answered, yes, you do have to mention the TSMNO and the multimodal as well as the build. So that's three. But as far as doing an evaluation matrix, you only have to um, build in a no build for um, type uh, type two projects and an EA. Of course, uh, Lauren mentioned before for EISs, you have to have the reasonable range of alternatives. So has the pd &E manual been updated to include pavement type selection report? And that is a no. Uh, at this point, we aren't doing that in the uh, pd and &E phase um, unless the district specifically asks you to do it. So. Um, so that's a no at this point. I see one here asking about the units for the matrix, um, about the evaluation for floodplains and using both an area and a volume. Mm -hmm. I would suggest it isn't defined in the chapter, but I would use whatever unit you need to use to differentiate between your alternatives. OK. Let's see, you see any others that look good? I'm scrolling down through here. Should the evaluation matrix include all four alternatives, the TSMNO and multimodal? And the answer to that one is only when they meet the purpose and need. Otherwise, they're often eliminated before you even get to that step. Has the environmental component been added back to the preferred alternative? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was one of the updates. Oh, when I close out, it scrolls me back down to the to the top. Um, and we're not asking you to regurgitate all of the details. We really do want correct. you to reference those environmental supporting documents um, in that section of your PER. So I know it's tedious, but um, we're trying to check all the boxes. Just uh, reference that reference that supporting document and move on. <laughs> Let me add a little bit to that, Tally. In referencing, though, we, we still need it summarized. We, we have right. had examples where they say, go read the report, and it's like, well, a little bit of information might be a little helpful in this document. So, yeah. Yeah, Right, so like two, two sentences, <laughs> yes. maybe not just not just one sentence, but two sentences, so right. at least, well, yes. And the key, too, there is that it needs to address anything that would affect the engineering decisions made for the project. So if there is a key point in one of those supporting documents that changes how you analyze the project or your alternatives, it needs to be documented in the PER, and you need to explain that um, as part of the alternatives analysis. Um, I see one here about asking about the repetitiveness between the preferred alternative and the engineering and environmental considerations. Um, are we repeating all of this information in addition to including in the preferred alternative section? Yes and no. There is a chance to expand a little bit more in the preferred alternative section if it works for your document and you can refer back to a section um, instead of repeating verbatim. I think that makes sense, but it's kind of a mixed bag on, on how to answer that and what works for your document. You want to make sure that all of your bases are covered in the preferred alternative to meet those 
um, what was it, 23 tally? <laughs> 23 I items that need so. to be addressed yeah. in the preferred alternatives section. So, all right, let's see, what are some other questions? I see, is a VE study required for projects that are only funded uh, by state funds and uh, they are required? So, if it meets the cost threshold. If, if it meets the cost threshold, and they're not always done in pd &E, but but yes, they, they are required if it meets the cost, cost threshold. Mm -hmm. I see a question here about, can you give examples of TSMNO alternatives in case of roadway widening? Um, that's kind of a mixed question between like a, a widening alternative versus a TSMNO alternative. But I can give you some examples of what you might see in a TSMNO alternative. Um, and this is listed in the chapter as well, but some TSMNO strategies may include upgrades or additions to the existing facilities, such as ramp signals, arterial traffic management systems, traffic incident management, work zone traffic management, road weather management, traveler information services, congestion pricing, parking management, traffic control, commercial vehicle operations, transit priority signals systems, and freight management. So those can all be considered as part of your TSMNO alternative, but if the TSMNO alternative does not meet the purpose and need, those features and strategies can still be included in a build alternative. And I, I see a good question here. Does the purpose and need wording also need to be consistent between the PER and the type 2 CE? Yes. And actually, we've made that we've made that a little bit even harder, or not harder. It has to be exactly the same between the PER and the type 2. So before you sign and seal the PER, make sure the type 2 uh, purpose and need is set and finalized as well. Um, but, but that is a relatively new requirement, so they do need to be exactly the same. Or they need to be consistent is how they meet with um, the ETDM and, and other documents. They don't, obviously, we're not going to go back and make them be the same for all the documents. They just need to be consistent. But between the PER and the Type 2, they need to be exact word for word. That's one place where we ask you to actually cut and paste. I see a question here. Um, when do you create the LREs? So, we obviously have our alternatives where we're comparing them um, and project costs are part of that alternatives analysis matrix. We're not really requiring you to necessarily develop your LREs for each alternative, but I think it's useful <laughs> um, because then when you do get down to your preferred alternative and you have your preferred alternative LRE, it's already kind of built. Um, you can create another version of that LRE for your preferred. Maybe your preferred was refined um, as it moves along the pro progression of your project. And so, you know, more things are discovered and um, you can then incorporate that into your LRE. Once your LRE is built, if you're familiar with the LRE system, um, it's easy to build off of that LRE. So I, I would say it would be useful just to, to do it for your alternatives and your preferred alternative, um, but it is not specifically required. Um, to have LREs for your for your alternatives, if that makes sense, you can have just project costs develop in a spreadsheet if that if that is um, you know reasonable for your method of comparison between alternatives. But I love LRE. Anybody who knows me, um, that is a great <laughs> tool. If you are an LRE user, I could talk days about the LRE system, um, and I, I do think that you know it, it's a DOT tool. Um, and if you have a DOT project, it's eventually going to need an LRE, so might as well get it started um, in that beginning phase of your PD&E and kind of carry it through the life of the project. Got a couple of questions and comments asking about when the new PER template will be uploaded and how there's a little bit of inconsistency on the subsections, um, especially that new environmental subsection. Those will be posted very soon. Um, we're just putting some final touches on it as we were developing the presentation, so it should be soon. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of new questions come in. Um, folks, if you have them, please feel free to add them to the list. I think we've gotten through the majority of them. 
If there's one that we missed that you need an answer for, let us know. Um, another thing that I was thinking about as we were going through uh, the presentation is a lot of this information is for has been tailored to folks who have been doing pd &E for a while. So if you're new to pd &E, um, hopefully this gave you a good overview of engineering analysis for FDOT pd &E projects. But there's a lot of great information available out there. Um, if you have anything that comes to mind, um, if you have any questions after the presentation, we had, I can bring up Catherine's contact information for you again. You're welcome to reach out to us. Um, Catherine, we have a question regarding the timing of when the 2024 manual is supposed to be um, utilized for projects. Do we have a date for that? Well, I guess typically it's for any project that starts after. I don't know that the, the changes in the, the document, I mean, in the... Um, in the manual are so great that they're going to change any ongoing PERs. I would kind of look at it and see if there's any anything that you don't have. If it doesn't match the exact um, outline of the um, in the chapter at this moment, and it's an ongoing uh, PER, we you know we can work around that. But but for the most part, I, I don't think there are any great changes that's going to really affect uh, what what you would be doing now. The one thing okay. that must be done though is back to the purpose and need. You you must have the purpose and need. That is something we we're, we've been checking for about a year now. Make sure it's the the same for, for both documents. Okay. Victor, I see a question here about a policy for IPC. Um, Catherine, can you expand on that or do we need to ask Victor for some more information? Either more information or we're going to have to do a little research and get a good answer to that. He's talking about um, major projects that are greater than $150 million. Okay. They're to be reviewed by a central office from the pd &E phase. I, I'm not familiar with that. I do know major projects have different um, different rules for other things like risk assessments and value engineering, et cetera. I did not know about them needing to be re re reviewed by CO. So, so that's something we'll just have to do a little research on. I, I haven't run across that yet, Victor. Okay. And I guess Victor also asked a question about a new um, capacity policy, which unfortunately, I'm showing my ignorance again. I, I wasn't familiar with the new capacity project, so we'll have to do a little, little research on that one as well, Victor. Right. I see that um, Victor also asked about project coordination documented in the comments and coordination report. So we have internal and external FDOT coordination. Internal coordination is documented within the PER and most likely in the relevant sections that are being affected. And agency coordination is the one that is summarized in the comments and coordination report. I feel like we're kind of asking for both agency and external yes. and internal in the PER. Um, you know, kind of making sure that, especially with your environmental agencies, um, some of that coordination is important and to know why decisions were made along the life of the project and need to be summarized. I mean, maybe, maybe obviously, you know, expanded on further in your comments and coordination report. Um, but touched on in your PER. One way I like to look at that is again, going back to that statement that if it affects the engineering decisions that are made for the project, you need to tell that story in the PER. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we don't, you know, if it's not stated that way in the chapter, that's probably a decent guideline to go by. Um, what are some of the common mistakes we should look out for when preparing documents? Biggest one I could say is missing sections. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that you use that template, you use the chapter, um, make sure that all of your sections are identified. Um, and if something isn't applicable, let us know. Another, another one I see um, is tying back to the, the criteria. You know, you, you kind of set forth your design criteria at the beginning of your project, then you get, you know, a year and a half, two years down, you have your preferred alternative. Um, I look in the appendix at the preferred alternative plans and I see improvements along all these side roads and all these different types of facilities, but they mm -hmm. didn't have any criteria set forth. That's a good so point. really, you just, you know, as things progress, just make sure you're covering all of your boxes, um, making sure that we're meeting criteria, 
not only for your main line, but other supporting or, you know, arterials and things that would be proposed improvements of your prefer preferred alternative. Um, Catherine, we got one here I want to throw your way. Um, the one about the class of action, when is that usually determined for a pd &E study? I know that's being moved later in the process. Um, it, it is moved later in the process, um, especially now that we have the different rules for EAs and EISs. At this point, an EA, once we determine, once we set the class of action, we have exactly one year to complete it. So we're trying to uh, set the class of actions uh, just prior to the public hearing so that we have uh, as much time as possible to, to, um, to go through the, the rest of the process after the public hearing section. So we kind of let that um, go to our type twos as well. So we're, we're uh, making this, the decision later the project than we used to so I guess previously we'd be doing it right after the um, ETDM summary report and we're now pushing it out until we've done um, done a lot of the pd &E, like I said right up to uh, the public hearing and for an EA the the document has to be re reviewed by OEM prior to the hearing so the class of action is usually um, maybe a month to two months prior to the public hearing so that we can get all those documents approved and ready for the Okay. There's one in here asking about if the build alternative includes multimodal features, do you need to do a separate multimodal alternative? And it really goes back to that grading criteria of the purpose and need statement. If the multimodal alternative does not meet the purpose and need on its own, then you can just state that as part of your alternatives analysis. Then those multimodal features and aspects can be included in a build alternative have a question here about can we reference the comments and coordination report instead of summarizing yes and no um, as long as you are summarizing the key points um, and then referencing for the rest of the documentation if there's something important that came out of the coordination that affects the engineering decisions i would recommend um, summarizing that in the per We've got two minutes left, lots of good questions coming through. What happens if a pd &E is initially identified as a type two and it becomes a type one? And that, that has happened um, lately. So if, if you have a type two that you're gonna be downgrading to a type one, you probably wanna um, at least touch base with us here in OEM and make sure that we, we, we agree with it being downgraded. Um, and you might have to uh, you know, reach out maybe via email or through the EST to the um, ETAP members and, and let them know it's being ground, downgraded. So if you have good reason for downgrading it to type one, that that's done and it's not that difficult. Just, just work with us on that and with the district on that. All right. I think the rest of them um, we can handle separately. Is there anything else that we need to go over before we close out the presentation? Um, everyone has the links to the documents and resources page, the pd &E manual, and um, this chapter you can download. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, Catherine's contact information is listed here on the slide. Catherine, I think we're good to close it out. If there's anything okay. else you'd like to say. Nope, I'm good. Thank you guys for um, your attention and for hanging out so long. And, um, and please join us for other training as we, as we get more out there. Thank you all for attending. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone.